Hello. Today, I wanted to talk about Martin Luther King, and I want to try something different. Instead of writing a big wall of text, I am going to see how speaking goes. He's someone that I've been thinking about for quite some time, for a couple of years, in fact. And it's not just because of the state of politics and racism that, that's going on, but it, it, was, it is his ability to speak and articulate and be passionate in order to communicate to the crowd and people in general. Something that I've been going through, you can say almost the last decade, is being able to speak up in situations where no one else will. And this is something I'm starting to realize that times in our life when there's something going on, people for the most part will stay silent. And for me, I've, I'm starting to realize just how powerful words can be in communicating both what your frustrations and where you think things should go. And in doing so, it can change people or move people at times. People have asked me for help, asked me to speak up for them on their behalf, and I've done so. And you've seen some of it where I can be a little harsh to people on Facebook. But for me, all the time, it, seem, it seems like it is the right time to do so because there's no one else that will come up and, and speak up on your behalf. And in doing this, I've started to realize my understanding of how to use words and how to communicate has shifted. I used to be, in a very real sense, naive. I used to think that if I just spoke up, people will listen. And you can see a lot of this in Facebook today where people will argue political with political discussions with facts. Facts do not work is what I've realized. And I realized it long ago, well before Trump came into the picture. I've learned that in order to communicate, you actually have to reach out into people's emotional side as well. And this is where passion comes in. For me, I see passion as the alignment of your thought and your emotions, each one driving the other in a direction that you feel is right. And that to me is what, when you, when you are passionate about something in your life, like your job, it means that the, what you, how you feel about your job and how you act in your job, they are both one and the same. And the same thing can come across with words and speeches that when you talk about something and the emotions that are conveyed along with those words, if they line up to the audience, the audience will listen and the audience will follow you. And I think this to me is, in my, in my view, one of the most underrated parts of Martin Luther King's legacy. That in a way you can say this is white privilege, but for me, this is probably the biggest part that resonates with me is his ability to speak to a crowd for things that are unjust. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. And to start off, let's talk about the I Have a Dream speech. And this is one we all know, at least we all know I Have a Dream and some of those quotes along with it. But if you really take a step back and you look at the speech and you read the speech, and I don't know if anyone's talked about it in this light, but it it is obviously a very passionate speech and a very moving speech, but I don't know if people can understand why. For me, there's a two aspects to this. One is he conveyed emotions. It was very passionate and then the thought and to go into it and to describe it a little bit, he started off the speech talking about beginning with the ending of slavery. He then went into talking about the plight and the, the injustice that black people of America had it at that day, how it felt. He used a lot of metaphors and allegories in how to communicate the emotion of how frustrating it was, to put it very lightly. He then switched gears as after that and started addressing Black people of America at the time. And he did so in a very powerful way where he was saying that these are what he expected of them. And if you look at that, the first part of speech really was laying the foundation, laying the groundwork for what he viewed the world should be, or America should be at least. And that he did so by describing the situation to everybody and how he saw it. And even though we all know I have a dream, and that's the speech that we call it, it wasn't until towards the end where he actually started saying that. And he did so in a very passionate and from his point of view. 
And that's the part that people remember. And remember, people don't remember what you say, but how you make them feel. And people felt it when he said, I have a dream. And when I talk about passion, the balance between emotions and thought, the other thing I noticed with the speech is that he started off with a very logical and a factual way, but there was still an underlying emotional part to it. There's an emotional key that help bring the people along. People are listening and people are engaged. And if you can imagine him as a preacher, it's hard not to listen to the passion and feelings that are involved in everything he says. But the first part was more logical and thought, but it was had an underlying feeling. But when he said, I have a dream, and he started talking about his future for America, it turned. He then became extremely emotional and it had the underlying feeling of logic below it. But you can tell that he was a very emotional, this is where we need to go. And I think to me, it's that dichotomy in the speech that's pretty amazing on how he laid the groundwork and then he flipped it around and saying, this is where we need to go. The other thing I realized about the speech is he did so in a very honest manner, that everything he said was his point of view, what he thought people were feeling or what he thought things should happen. One of the things I realized with politicians, and you can see even at Facebook, and I would imagine most of you seeing this are the same way, that when you're frustrated about something, you tell other people how to act, how they should behave or should feel a certain way. And that's the biggest problem of how things never get done. He spoke in terms of this is who he is and how he feels, and he expressed that beautifully to America as a whole and to the world. And I think that's the brilliance of the speech in a lot of ways. It's the way he did so in a very honest manner and in a very passionate manner. And I think, I don't know if he knew what he was doing or many people did, but it's to me, it's that balancing of emotion and thought. And he was able to, to do that. Another way I think about passion is music, is that I think that passion and listening music is very similar. That when you put on headphones to listen to your favorite song, you sort of lose yourself in that moment. And that's the same with being passionate. And if you look at that speech, it was a melody. He constructed a song. The first part was the soft buildup of a song. And the second part where he started speaking passionately was the crescendo. Or in terms of electronic music, when the beat dropped. And looking at that speech, to me, it's more... It's amazing just from the technicalities that go into it, whether people realize it or not. And this is what I'm starting to appreciate about everything he wrote and said. Another thing I wanted to talk about was his letter that he wrote while in the Birmingham jail. This was a time where he had time to reflect. If you can imagine, he was going through all this turmoil and finally he's sitting in jail and had time to think. And this is where he wrote a letter, I believe, to a, a bunch of pastors, of white pastors mostly people that he viewed as their allies, but I think were either thinking he was doing the wrong thing or no, not going far enough. But in this letter, you can tell that he was also very honest. He kept on using the word I and, and expressed how he viewed things and his frustration and his realization. Going to the realization, this is the part where he mentions, and something has resonated to me just outside of racism as well, that he did not think that the racist organizations like Ku Klux Klan were his biggest problem, but the white moderates, the people who wanted a negative piece of tolerance over a positive piece of justice. And this is something I've dealt with personally in different ways, but this is something that's always resonated. And he wrote this in this entire letter. And if you read the letter, it's a very passionate one. And I say passionate. Passion doesn't mean just a positive emotion, but it was passionate. And as you can tell, he you could feel what he was feeling. You could see what he was thinking at the time. To me, it was a good snapshot as a civil rights leader in that moment where he has time to reflect. And that, and I just love that letter because everything was just honest about himself and how he saw the world. And when I take some of these things and take a step back, it's how he led an entire group of people and achieving what he did. He did so in a different way than most people do or most people expect to lead. He led by just being honest and being himself. He led by moving forward without really stopping. 
And I think that's the brilliance behind it, that when people say he fought for civil rights, I think that does it somewhat injustice. He just kept moving towards what he thought was civil rights, and people kept following and listening. Yes, he may have led protests and demonstrations, but he did so to bring people along with him and not fight for something. And doing so is in a very honest way, which I think is, as I mentioned, is underutilized. But anyway, it's just looking at how he used those words is something that is starting to resonate with me, to put it best. And the way he used words and talked and articulated this, it goes in the same way as that letter that my great grandmother wrote, where she was a college student. and It was right before women were allowed to vote. And she wrote that uh, pro, you know, women's voting rights essay while she was in college. And the way she, she went through those words is very passionate as well. And there was a melodic flow to it that I could see and feel as I read through it. And there's a lot of similarities in the way even Martin Luther King did it. But to end this all, yeah, I think for me, the way he presented his view and presented his, his thoughts, it's not something that many people do. And I think not many people realize. They just see it some, as a passionate speech, but not somebody who is just explaining their emotions and their views in a sense of clarity that just resonates with everybody else. He never told, he never came across as telling people what to do, but people yet followed, which is one of the most powerful things in the world. Anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about. Thanks.